it's a letter. Uh, so, so you know, I said there was prophecies and instructions. Some of, some of the things in the Bible are just letters. And this is like, you know, you wrote a letter, dear John. It's, so this is a letter to a, a church called the Church of Thessalonica, or some people say Thessalonica. And it's a place in Greece, a real place with real people, where someone one time went and told people about Jesus, and they believed in him, and they formed a group called a church, and then eventually someone wrote a letter to them. So, you interested? Yeah. Okay. So, and we'll take some weeks to read through. It's pretty short, actually. If I, I was curious, like if it were written on a regular eight and a half by eleven, like we would write letters, how many pages it would take? So I put it in Word, copied the whole thing in Word, put it on a big font size, 12, 12 point font size, three pages. So it's just like a letter that you would read today, and you could, you could go home today and read the whole thing. I've read it several times just in the past few days to try to get a feel for what is happening in this story. So to help us, we're going to watch a really short video by a place, if you don't know it, you need to know it, called The Bible Project. So y you and I live in an age where we have access to the most amazing resources to help us understand God's Word. It's a group of people called the Bible Project that are just, they're Bible geeks. Tim Mackey loves the Bible and wants to tell everyone about the Bible. And so he has a series of short videos that tell you a, a brief synopsis and a background of each book in the Bible. Just like a few minutes. And here's his little video on 1 Thessalonians. Let's watch this. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. This is most likely the earliest letter that we have from Paul, and the backstory for it is found in the book of Acts. It's where Paul and his co-worker Silas went to the ancient Greek city of Thessalonica. And after just one month of telling people the good news about Jesus, a large number of Jewish and Greek people gave their allegiance to Jesus, and they formed the first church community there. But trouble was brewing. Paul's announcement of the risen Jesus as the true Lord of the world, it led to suspicion. So the Christians in Thessalonica were eventually accused of defying Caesar, the Roman emperor, when they said that there is another king, Jesus. And this led to a persecution that got so intense, Paul and Silas actually had to flee from the city, and this was painful for them because they loved the people there so much. And so this letter is Paul's attempt to reconnect with the Christians in Thessalonica after he got a report from Timothy that they were doing more than okay, they were flourishing despite this intense persecution. He designed the letter to have two main movements. First is a celebration of their faithfulness to Jesus, and then he challenges them to keep growing as followers of Jesus. And then these two movements are surrounded by three prayers. The letter opens with a thanksgiving prayer, the two movements are linked together by a transitional prayer, and then the whole thing is concluded with a final prayer. It's a beautiful design. Paul opens by giving thanks and celebrating the Thessalonians' faith, their love for others, and their hope in Jesus despite persecution. He goes on to retell the story of their conversion, how they used to be idolatrous polytheists, and they were living in a culture where all of life was permeated by institutions and practices that honored the Greek and Roman gods. And Paul talks about how they turned away from those idols to serve the living and true God, and that they're now waiting for the coming of God's Son from heaven. So in a city like Thessalonica, transferring your allegiance to the creator God of Israel and to King Jesus, this came at a cost. Isolation from your neighbors, hostility from your family. But for the Thessalonians, the overwhelming love of Jesus who died for them and the hope of his return, it made it all worth it. Paul then retells the story of his mission in Thessalonica and of the dear friendships he formed with the people. He uses really intimate metaphors here. They treated him like their child, and he became like their mother and like their father. He says, we were happy to share with you not only the good news from God, but our very selves, because we came to dearly love you. Paul reminds us here that the essence of Christian leadership is not about power and having influence. It's about healthy relationships and humble, loving service. He reminds them that he never asked for money. He simply came to love and serve them in the name of Jesus.
And so Paul moves on to reflect on their common persecution. Just like Jesus was rejected and killed by his own people, so now Paul is persecuted by his fellow Jews, and the Thessalonians are facing hostility from their Greek neighbors. And Paul draws a strange comfort from knowing that together their sufferings are a way of participating in the story of Jesus' own life and death. Paul then shares about the anguish he experienced when he heard of the hardships the Thessalonians had after he and Silas fled. So he sent Timothy to support them and see how they were doing. And to his joy, Timothy discovered that they were going strong. They were faithful to Jesus. They were full of love for God and their neighbors. And they longed to see Paul as much as he longed to see them. And so Paul concludes with a prayer for endurance. And what's cool is that he introduces here the topics he's going to address in the letter's second half. He prays that God will grow their capacity to love, that he'll strengthen their commitment to holiness as they fix their hope on the return of King Jesus. So he opens the letter's second movement by challenging them to a life that's consistent with the teachings of Jesus. So this means, first of all, a serious commitment to holiness and sexual purity. In contrast to the promiscuous, sexually destructive culture around them, they are to follow Jesus' teaching about experiencing the beauty and the power of sex within the haven of a committed marriage covenant relationship. God takes sexual misbehavior seriously, Paul says. It dishonors and destroys people and their dignity. Following Jesus also means a commitment to loving and serving others. So Paul instructs them that Christians should be known in the city as reliable people who work really hard, not just to make money, but so that they can have resources to provide for themselves and to generously share with people who are in need. After this, Paul addresses a number of questions the Thessalonians had raised about the future hope of Jesus' return. So some Christians in the church had recently died, most likely killed as martyrs, and their friends and family are wondering about their fate when Jesus returns. And so Paul makes it clear that despite their grief and loss, not even death can separate Christians from the love of Jesus. When he returns as king, he will call both the living and the dead to himself. And Paul uses a really cool image here. He uses language that would normally describe how a city subject to the Roman Caesar would send out a delegation to welcome or meet his arrival. Paul then applies this imagery to the arrival of King Jesus. He too will be greeted by a delegation of his people who will go to meet the Lord in the air as they welcome and escort him back to this world where he'll establish his kingdom of justice and peace. Paul then wants the Thessalonians to see how this hope should motivate faithfulness to Jesus. So he pokes fun at the famous Roman propaganda that it's Caesar who brings peace and security. Of course, Rome's peace came through violence, through enslaving their enemies and military occupation. And Paul warns that Jesus will return as king one day and confront this kind of injustice. Followers of King Jesus should live in the present as if that future day is already here. Despite the nighttime of human evil around them, they should stay sober and awake as the light of God's kingdom dawns here on earth as it is in heaven. Paul closes all of these exhortations like he began with a hopeful prayer that God would permeate their lives with his holiness, that he would set them apart to be completely devoted and blameless until the return of King Jesus. 1 Thessalonians reminds us that from the very beginning, following Jesus as king has produced a truly countercultural or holy way of life. And this will sometimes generate suspicion and conflict among our neighbors. But the response of Jesus' followers to such hostility should always be love, meeting opposition with grace and generosity. And this way of life, it's motivated by hope in the coming kingdom of Jesus that has already begun in his resurrection from the dead. And so holiness, love, and future hope, that's what 1 Thessalonians is all about. Wasn't that awesome? So just note again, BibleProject.oh, is it .com or .org? Just use your search engine for the Bible Project. Every book of the Bible. So if you're kind of new to reading the Bible and you're like, I don't understand this. Wasn't that helpful? You're like, I want to read that book now. I get what it's about. So we're going to open it up together and see what we can experience in reading some of it. We'll probably read the first chapter today, but I'm going to do a little, a little backstory, repeating some of what he said. By the way, you probably got 
one of these when you came in. Um, and once again, we have <clears throat> some of the scriptures and ideas that I intend to share with you. Uh, you can use that if you want. Don't if you don't. Take it home and read it again. I don't know. Do whatever you want with it. And um, also, like a, a video and an audio of what we're doing right now will be available in the next week or sooner if you want to, if you're like, oh, I learned something, I want to hear that again. So at the top, excuse me while I cough, <coughs> had to get that out. So at the top of the, the note thing and also probably on the screen is a map, is that right? There it is, yeah. So I, I just wanted to, to give you a feel of what's going on, repeating what he said. And this is to help you when you're reading um, Acts, the book of Acts, which tells the story of, of the journey that got us to where we are, where Paul would write a letter to a church called the Thessalonians. And um, if you remember the story, Acts 16, Paul and his team are trying to go to different places, and the Holy Spirit keeps saying, no, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. And he gets a vision in the middle of the night to go to, a, he's in a beach town called Troas at the time. He sees someone in this place called Macedonia, which is that whole area. You see Macedonia on the top? So that whole area is called Macedonia. And he gets a vision of someone saying, come over and help us. So immediately they set sail and go to Philippi. You see Philippi up on the upper right? <clears throat> okay, so they go there and they start telling people about Jesus and they start responding. And before you know it, there's a little church. Um, out of nowhere, there are people gathered and listening to Paul teaching, worshiping, and in that time, um, there was a girl who was a fortune teller, and she was a slave in the Roman culture, and she was demonized. There was an evil spirit, and it was, uh, her activity was bugging Paul, so finally Paul had enough, and he says, in the name of Jesus, leave her, and cast a demon out of her. And she's set free, but... Now her owners are really irritated because they had a way of making money from her fortune telling that's now gone. So as usual, you can just follow the money to see what happens. Nothing has changed much in all of history. And those people stir up a crowd against Paul. Paul and Silas end up in jail over this thing. First, they're flogged, and they end up in jail. This is all in Acts 16. Flog is like they're whipped. Uh, in the middle of the night, instead of complaining, at midnight, they are singing and worshiping Jesus. They're singing, all my life you have been faithful. You know, you're so good. It's midnight. They're not going, oh, my aching back. You know, give me an aspirin. No, they're singing, worshiping, and the rest of the prisoners are hearing, and God is listening, and he begins to tap his feet with the music. And when he does, it causes an earthquake. Now, I made that part up, but he did cause an earthquake. <laughs> Some of you believed me. They're all like, he did? He tapped his foot? That's in the Bible? No. He causes an earthquake, though, and the earthquake causes the prison doors to swing open and some of their chains that were attached, you know, to the walls to break free. And the prison guard's like, oh, no, and my prisoners are escaping. He's going to kill himself. And they go, no, no, don't kill yourself. We're still here. By the way, if you're a prison guard, a jailer at this time, it's your life for the prisoners. You would be killed if they escaped. So he's going to just do suicide. They say no. So he brings Paul and Silas into his house, cleans up their wounds. His whole family gets saved. They leave in the morning and go to Thessalonica. So in Thessalonica, they um, start having success. They go first to the Jewish synagogue and for three Saturdays, you know, Jews meet on Saturday. So for three Saturdays in a row, which is three weeks, Paul opens up the Hebrew Scriptures and proves to them that the Messiah would have to suffer and die and rise again. He shows them that in their own Scriptures and then says, Jesus that we're telling you about is that Messiah. And some people, after this three weeks of teaching, begin to follow him and join them. And a new church is born. And there's some Jews, but there's also God-fearing Greeks. And um, the letter Acts mentions not a few, probably many, prominent women. In this culture, um, women can be strong leaders, business owners. They have, it's not like some other places where women were just put down. At this time, in this place in Thessalonica, there are women leaders. So there's, this is the crowd. A church is born. 
Well, the Jewish people at the synagogue are jealous. They've been trying to grow this thing, and, you know, they only have a few people showing up on Sabbath. And here Paul comes in, preaches about Jesus, and he's got a crowd. He's got a church. He's got a crowd. And they're jealous, and they go, and they round up some people from some, some you know, bad, reputed people from the city area, form a mob, cause there to be a city riot. Things are going crazy. Um, it, uh, picture riot, right? You, crowds of people, you know, I don't know. Maybe, did you watch when the January 6th, they were all like, you know, they're yelling and they're going to storm the Capitol. That kind of, that kind of atmosphere. So they, they go looking for Paul and storm a house where he's been staying. A guy named Jason has a house, and they've been hanging out there. They don't find Paul there, but the crowd grabs Jason, and they take him to the magistrates, and they make him post bond, you know, like you're going to come back for, for a trial, just like us. And the Christian believers, this brand new church, and Paul's been there, we don't know, but weeks, just, you know, three Sabbaths, and then um, some weeks, maybe, um, they, uh, they quickly grab Paul and sneak him out, and he goes to the next city, Berea. It's kind of interesting how he just goes up there, there, and there. Macedonia is getting filled with the word of God. Churches are being planted. Um, it's quite a team. In Berea, things go well, and um, a new church is planted there. But the people in Thessalonica that didn't like Paul up there, they heard, oh, he's in Berea now having success. They come down there and cause some more trouble. So persecution there, stir them up. So the brothers, the, the new Christians in Berea, escort Paul to Athens. See Athens down there? So while he's at Athens, he's still worried about those Thessalonian Christians. He'd only been them with a, a little while. And he's probably thinking, wow, did we tell him enough? It was such a bummer that we had to leave. I wonder if they even believe anymore. Persecution is tough. I wonder if there's any are still in the faith. He's praying for them. He's so concerned. He's so worried that his friend Timothy's with him, and he sends Timothy back. He writes about this in the letter. So just hop into the story, the backstory. First Thessalonians chapter three. He says, "So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ." to strengthen you and encourage you in your faith so that no one be unsettled by these trials. You know, we want you to know God is with you. So we encourage him. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, destined for trials, persecution. So they were warned. You're going to follow Jesus, you're going to get trouble. People are going to turn against you, but it's worth it. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid in some way that the tempter might have tempted you, and our efforts may have been useless. So he's like, you know, can you imagine the fear there? So Timothy goes, and Paul's done in Athens. Now he goes down, the map's gone, to Corinth. See Corinth down there? So the Bereans had taken him down to Athens. Now he's in Corinth. Now, he spent quite a while in Corinth. This is Acts 18. <clears throat> um, several years, it seems like. He did the same thing, goes to the Jewish synagogue, proclaims the gospel, and they launch a church there. Um, the, the Jewish leaders in the synagogue get abusive, so he goes over to the house of a guy named Titius Justus, or Titius, I don't know how you say that, Titius, however you say that Greek name, and basically starts a house church. Many believe the church is born. He stays there at least a year and a half. While he's there, as best we can tell, this part we're not positive, but when we look through the timeline of what he said in the letter and what we read in Acts, it seems like now he's in Corinth. Timothy shows up and says, here's the report, Paul. I just got back from Thessalonica. And guess what? They're still in the faith. Actually, they're not only still in the faith, they are flourishing. And they really miss us. They really miss you, Paul. Just like you love them, they love you. Here's what, it, what Paul writes to the, to the Thessalonians. Timothy's just now returned and has brought us good news about your faith and love. See, I, I want us to read this letter like we're in it. I want to feel this. They, he's, you get this letter and go, hey, Timothy just got back from you. You're like, yeah, we just said goodbye to him. How long did it take him to get home? 
Okay, so he just got back to us, and he told us, you always have pleasant memories of us. You long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we are encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How we thank God. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of God? Just pause a moment. Are you, are you in the story yet? Imagine you are receiving this letter. You didn't even know Paul was thinking about you. And he says to you, so you thought he was some heroic big guy that travels around making new churches you didn't know he even thought about you, and he's been thinking about you, and you get this letter and says, I can't tell you how happy I am that you're doing good. Susan, you're still in the faith, and I'm so overjoyed. I've been praying for you. Can you imagine getting a letter like that? And um, because of you, I'm overjoyed. Night and day, we pray most earnestly that me and we, we may see you again. You're like, oh, not only do we miss him, he misses us. See you again, and... and Fill you with what's lacking in your faith. We're sort of heading where I want to head, just in what I've been telling you, but let me pause and make it more clear. I don't want to just read the Bible from a distance and read some facts and maybe get some rules for living. When people say, you know, we've got a manual for living. It's the Bible. Not quite. This is a living story. And I think the way to best grow from the Bible is to experience it. You never, have you ever watched a movie where you forgot you were in the theater? You were in the story? That's the way, I think, to experience the Bible. Get in the story, feel it, try to get in their skin, try to get in their mindset. And we can experience, and then we can experience it. And I've had that this week as I've been trying to understand Thessalonians. So, have any of you ever gone on a missions trip, like a week, two days, three days, or a ministry trip somewhere, or you were a camp counselor for some high schoolers, maybe, junior hires? Or you taught a small group. Or you did something where you went to serve people. And it might have been short. Do you remember how quickly people that you didn't even know existed are deeply in your heart? Do you remember that experience? Like the people that we've met in Africa. Going to Breath of Heaven. Like you would die for them, right, Michelle? You, you don't even know they exist. Then a day later, you meet them, and then you are be teaching the Bible together, and now you're praying for them. Now they've told you some of their life. You quickly, deeply love people that were total strangers. Maybe you go to um, the park, and to serve the homeless, and you sit down and eat, and you hear some stories, and before you know it, you love these people. Now, this is Paul and Silas. Can you feel it? They, they met these people, and there's a number of them, and they know their stories. They know this one had this kind of trauma growing up, and we prayed, and God did some healing for their heart. And this one, oh, when they got saved, they completely turned away from a really crazy lifestyle involved in the temple with the prostitutes and the drinking and the nuts life they were living. They turned completely away from that there with Jesus and their, their life changed, and they're happy, and they have joy, and they're saved, and they're sins. And you're just like, it was so incredible, right? And now you got sucked away, and you don't have the internet. You're not going to FaceTime them. There's no emails. And you're thinking about them, wondering how they're doing. Feel that when you read Paul's words, when you read this letter. Feel that. Have you ever found out that some people were trying to find you and were frantically trying to find you and you didn't know that anyone was looking for you 
And finally they get connected with you and you go, oh, you're all right. Oh my gosh, I've been calling you for hours. Where, is your phone off? What's, have you ever had that experience? And, and you find out that someone was seriously worried about you, praying for you. And like if, they, if they're your parent and you were a kid and they used to be mad at you, suddenly all is forgiven and they love you and they're hugging you. Oh, I miss, I'm so glad you're okay. Do you know that? Can you feel that experience? And you, you didn't know that someone was even thinking about you. Okay, that's the Thessalonians. Imagine you're just tooling all in life. Paul left and now you're figuring it out. And you're persecuted and you're trying to follow Jesus and you open the Bible together. And you didn't know that Paul and Silas have been dying, worrying about you, praying for you. And all of a sudden you get this letter. Oh, Timothy shows up. And he's like, oh, are you guys okay? We've been thinking about you. We've been praying for you. How are you? And then, then a little while later, you get a letter from Paul telling you how much you mean to him. When you read this letter, feel that. Imagine you're the people who didn't even know the guys were thinking about you. And you find out they've been up day and night thinking about you, praying for you. And they represent God. And God sees you. Which might be the, the, the point on the whole talk today. God sees you. Did you feel the love in the room when the graduates were recognized? Yeah. Do you think they felt some kind of love? Yeah. Have you ever labored hard for the Lord and, and you got kind of irritated and you thought no one even cares? They don't even see how much you work. Why do I keep doing this? How it feels to find out that actually someone did know. God saw it and some of his people saw it. That's, that's the dynamic, okay? Okay, so with that in mind, now let's get in both those mindsets as, as we can try to and read some of this. We'll try, try to read this, you know, the first chapter, which is really just, you know, the first couple paragraphs. In, in ancient letters, they don't say... Um, dear Vanessa, talk, 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 sincerely, Ron. They say, hi, this letter's from Ron, so you know who it's from. You don't have to go to the end to figure out who wrote you a letter. And then they tell you what they're going to say. <clears throat> so it starts out, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Shalom. J just a second. So the, the, the way I read this is that by reading what we said earlier, the backstory, Timothy's just got back from Thessalonica. Paul and Silas are in Corinth, remember? And Timothy says, okay, I've got the report. <laughs> They're doing great. Paul, Silas, and Timothy start praising God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving them. Thank you for sustaining them. Thank you for your spirit working. Thank you that they're still in the faith. Thank you that they're growing. They're praising God. They're rejoicing. And Paul says, we got to write him a letter right now. Silas, do you have any paper? And he grabs his paper and his pen. And he says, Let, let's write this together. That's how I feel it happened. I don't know. But it has that dynamic, right? So now, with that, Paul, Silas, Timothy, to the church, Thessalonians, or Thessalonians, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you. Mention you in our prayers. See, it's just overflowing Paul's joy, his relief. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles open and you're like a writer in your Bible, I would circle work produced by faith, labor prompted by love, and endurance inspired by hope. Faith produces works. Love empowers us to labor and keep going. And hope that Jesus is actually going to return and make things right. Gives me what I need to endure the trials today. If you don't have hope, you're not going to endure. Hope to persevere. Your work reduced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance 
inspired by hope. Now, given what I was just saying about the mindset, did, like, Paul noticed our work? Oh, I didn't even know anyone was paying attention. And he's like, yeah, y y you have evidence that you have faith because you've been doing works of the kingdom. Doesn't that feel good to be noticed? God says to you, that work you've been doing, you know, where you were serving the ladies of the FRC, I saw that. Your faith resulted in a good work. And some of you labored because you love. I saw you. Well done. Do you feel that? That's what I feel. I, I began to get in the mindset of that, and I was like, I started to cry. Oh, God, you see. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Here's an application point. Follow Paul's example. Find a place where you can serve some people. And then let your heart be open to fall in love with them. Go on a ministry trip. Go serve somewhere. Go with Michael to serve at the meal. Go at Humanity Shower. Next time we go to the FRC, go to that. Go teach our Sunday school children. Go help Lisa with the youth group. Go to the Navigation Center. Help Vanessa over there. Oh, I'm sorry. I think everyone's called Vanessa. It's just easier. I met two Vanessas this morning sitting next to each other. They said, hi, I'm Vanessa, and I'm Vanessa. I remembered, hi, I'm Larry. This is my brother, Larry. Or was that Daryl? <laughs> I'm Daryl. This is my brother, Daryl. You guys just dated yourselves. Bob Newhart Show. <laughs> Follow Paul's example, allow your heart to be filled with love, regularly pray for them with thanksgiving. And then, well, don't write them a letter unless you want them. Send them a card, send them an email, send them a text. Let them know you were thinking about them. You'll be doing like what Paul exemplified, and they'll be experiencing what the Thessalonians experienced. Pretty simple application, huh? So I want to say this. Faith produces good works. So that's in there. I thought we were saved by faith apart from works. Well, you were. But faith that works, works. If your faith is working, so will you. Okay? So listen, uh, James writes about this in his letter. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works can faith save him that kind of faith if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and when he says to them go in peace be warmed and filled god bless you you smile and your teeth twinkle because they've been whitened without giving them the things they need for the body what good is that so also Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead faith. Ooh. <laughs> we are saved by faith through grace, apart from works. But faith that saves changes us. And its evidence is that we get to work. And we read that. I see your works produced by faith. Ephesians 2.8 says this. It's the part that says you're saved by faith apart from works. And then it says because you're created for works. Did you ever read the whole thing? For it says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's the gift of God, not by works. So that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Is, is Paul like bipolar there? No, it's not that you get saved by works, it's you get saved by faith, and then there's a change in you, and if you're really saved, you're motivated to do the works of the kingdom of God. And if I have no motivation to do the works of the kingdom of God, I might want to go back to Jesus and say, Jesus, what, how, how saved am I? <laughs> Maybe, because remember how Matt teaches us that we were saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved, because that's what the Bible teaches, past, current, and future. So if, if I am not doing nothing for Jesus, I might 
want to go back to Jesus and say, I, I think maybe I didn't give you all of me yet. I, I want to give you all of me. And I want to say, you now own me. My money, my time, my talent. How would you like me to spend them? Because I'm a steward of my money and my time and my talent. And you'll end up doing good works. <laughs> okay, back to First Thessalonians. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Some of you, maybe not in this room, but maybe you're hearing me, maybe you're in this room, sometimes wonder, I wonder, am I even really in the faith? Did God really choose me? I'm not sure I'm really saved. Regularly, there's someone I'll meet, they're like, I think I sin too much. I'm pretty sure that I'm the one that sins so much that God doesn't know what to do with me. For we know, brothers, love by God, he's chosen you. Well, how do you know? Well, because when our gospel came to you, it didn't come simply with words, but there was also some power. There was the Holy Spirit. And remember how convicted you were? You were like, oh, now that I see the truth, that there's one true God, Thessalonians, and I've been doing the pagan idol worship, and God does not approve because those aren't real gods. I'm so sorry, Lord. I want to follow you. Remember how you were deeply convicted? Remember you found out the way you've been treating people was not pleasing to God, and you felt some guilt about it, and you asked God to please forgive you? That is proof positive that God chose you. Because if he hadn't chose you, you wouldn't have given a flip. You wouldn't have cared. But he did chose you did choose you, sorry. <laughs> Learn how to talk here. <laughs> and he put his spirit in you, and his spirit moved you to follow his ways. We know that he loves you, he's chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. The idea there is probably there was some things going on, maybe some healing, maybe some prophetic words, maybe some of the power stuff. And deep conviction. Oh, this is interesting. Again, if you're like, circle your Bibles, watch this progression. You know, one, how we lived among you for your sake. Two, then you became imitators of us. This is about leading by example. Paul lived by example. You know how we lived. We were honest. We had integrity. We worked hard. We served you. That's how we lived because we were following Jesus and he taught us to do that. And then you quickly became imitators of us and of the Lord. And in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model. So that's the third, third movement. We showed you how to live. You copied us. And when you copied us, you became a model for all of Macedonia and Achaia, or Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith has become known everywhere. And they're like, what? And he's like, yeah. No. Yep, everyone's talking about you. Really? Yep. I, I, by the way, um, I can say to you, Grace Vineyard, people have been talking about you. Because I run in circles of the larger church, and I'll hear, oh, you guys are amazing. You could do all that work with the recovery people, right? I'm like, How'd you know? Well, we've heard. You have a reputation. They know you care for the homeless. It's a good one, yes. It's a good one. You became a model for all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from not only Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't even need to tell anyone about you. We don't need to say anything. For they themselves tell us about you and what kind of reception you gave to us. Thessalonians, Paul, I, and Silas, we showed up and you received us and welcomed us. We are foreigners. You opened your hearts to us. People are talking about how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God. 
and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from the coming wrath. And I'll stop reading there because our time's up. But you feeling the story? Okay, so just let me review, and it's in your notes there, application points. Godly leaders lead by example, not just words. A profound work of the Holy Spirit, look for it, ask for it. A profound work of the Holy Spirit in you is to have joy right in the middle of your troubles. And I'll tell you what, a, a little clue here. When you have trouble, don't look at your troubles and talk about them and complain about them. The Israelites did that when they came out of Egypt. And God was very, very unhappy. And many of them died. Because they were basically saying, well, you're not good enough, God. You don't take good care of us. Look at all these troubles. And they moaned and complained. But some of them gave thanks and looked to what God had done amongst them and rejoiced. And they found joy in their suffering. The choice is yours. You can either have misery in your suffering or you can have joy in your suffering. But you're probably going to have suffering either way. That's a promise. You're going to have some trouble. Do you want to enjoy God in the midst of it? Or do you want to be a whiner and a complainer and a grumbler and bring everyone down around you and be down yourself? A or B. I choose joy. So when the Holy Spirit does that, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. When you turn to God, some of you came from some really gnarly lifestyles. Really nasty, ugly, under Satan's control lives. And God has rescued you and redeemed you. That only, so that's, wow, that was happier than I thought. Okay. Your life, when that happens, becomes a living message to those around you. They're watching. Without you saying anything, people are seeing it. Your life becomes a living message example and inspiration to those inside and outside the church and then like getting back to the perspective from Paul all of you are called to be leaders because you're called to be a disciple who makes disciples and that's a leader right I you guys became you know you know saw how we law you saw how we lived among you you became imitators of us and then people saw what you did and you're a model of them that's discipleship People who become disciples who make disciples. And that's leadership. So healthy leaders pay attention to their folk. They pray about them. They care for them. And by extension, they're representing God. Flipping back to the perspective of the Thessalonians, you are being seen. We, the leaders, might not always say something. We might fall short on that part, but we do see you. And we're so thankful. And we're praying for you. And if you who are a leader, which is all of you, I hope, remember, see the people that you are caring for. And at least occasionally, write them a letter like this and say, you know what? I'm so happy about you. I see what God has done in your life. And I see how you are enduring such trouble. I'm absolutely amazed at you. Can't believe what you've gone through. And you're still with the Lord Wow, those kind of words coming from someone who's in a role of leadership are so healing and empowering, aren't they? Have you ever heard people say that to you? So healing and empowering. And he, he ended, and we have to end our time here on this funny little pr phrase that kind of is a cliffhanger. Waiting for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead who rescues us from the coming wrath. Dun, dun, dun. So there is coming wrath. What's wrath? That's God's righteous judgment against all of the injustice that you see around us in the world. All of the sinning that's hurting people. No one gets away with anything. No one gets away with anything. Either they look to Jesus and say, I'm guilty, but you've taken the penalty for all of my guilt, and I receive your forgiveness. Either they do that, or they go ahead and pay the penalty for their own guilt in the end. 
when God's wrath will finally come and all who have rejected Christ will be taken care of. They'll go to another place. They'll be taken away. When Jesus returns and establishes his good kingdom on earth and makes all things new and heaven and earth come together as one, you read about it in Revelation, you read about it in Isaiah, it's the hope that causes us to endure. So what do we call this whole thing? Encouragement to persevere with faith, love, and hope. Be like the Thessalonians. Be encouraged. Faith, love, hope. Good works, laboring, and enduring to the very end. And that's the intro to the first Thessalonians.